All right, hi everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is the first of our Tech Talk series that we're gonna be hosting throughout the week uh, with several industry leaders and experts. And I'm pleased to announce our first set of speakers, uh, President and COO of Red Wire Space, Andrew Rush, and former NASA Administrator, Jim Breinstein. I'll pass it over to Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Jim, thank you so much for being here. Um, I thought we could just chat a little bit about where we are today from a space perspective and where we're going in the next 10 or 20 years, right? I think we all feel like we're entering the second golden age of space. It's really driven by you know, technolo technological innovation, certainly driven by governments saying we want to do this, but it's also driven by like commercial enterprise. Uh, you know, we, we're going to see the first woman and the next man set foot on the moon and then sustainably be there. We're going to see... Uh, you know, the commercialization of low Earth orbit, both with new human activity in low Earth orbit, as well as just creation of new business models using, you know, using robotic assets, using satellites. And we're also, you know, we really acknowledge that we have a, you know, have emerging threats, both from, you know, potential space debris, as well as from potential adversaries, and that we need to protect all of this great activity that we have going on in space. So I'd really love your perspective on, on any of those areas that, that excite you, where you think it's going, and, and how, how we can get there. Yeah, no, just one, two, three. <laughs> <Ma. laughs> Here. Well, thank you for that question, Andrew. No, so uh, you're absolutely right. The future of space looks very different than the history of space. We love the history, uh, but when we think about the future, it's going to be driven largely by what I think separates the United States of America and a lot of our partners from other parts of the world, and that is the private sector, markets. Um, and I really believe, you know, what, when we think about the commercialization of space, um, NASA has a goal of, of being a customer, one customer of many in a, in a very robust commercial marketplace, both in low Earth orbit and, of course, now at the moon, which I think is, is fantastic. Um, so the, the key is NASA needs to do a number of things that I think are going to be transformational, not just NASA, but the government in general, and then on top of that, um, the private markets that are going to capitalize companies like Redwire and others that are going to be benefiting from all of these uh, great innovations, not just benefiting, but providing services that benefit the United States of America. So we think about low Earth orbit. We know the International Space Station can't last forever. I want to be really clear. We all love the International Space Station. It's also true that it's going to come to the end of its useful life at some point. And when that happens, we have to be prepared to not have a gap. Well, how are we going to not have a gap? We're, we're not going to build another International Space Station. That is not going to happen. What will happen is that NASA will provide, and I, I'm saying this not as the NASA administrator, but as the former NASA administrator, knowing a little bit about how NASA thinks about these things. NASA wants to be a customer, one customer of many. Um, and so the future uh, is LEO commercialization, which is something I know the NASA team was working on really hard when I was there, and something I know that Senator Nelson, now Administrator Nelson, um, was supportive of in the Senate and of course now very supportive of at NASA. So the future is NASA says, hey, we want to be a customer. We're going to help develop the demand side of the market. And that demand side, in my view, is fantastic. We can probably have a conversation about the value of microgravity, but there's a lot there. Um, but we also need to develop not just the demand side, also the, the supply side. Who, who is going to provide these, these platforms for the future? Um, and, and the customers that, are, that those, the, those platforms are going to be serving include NASA, other government agencies, and of course, a whole host of commercial companies. So um, that's just low Earth orbit. We talk about, you mentioned you know, the moon. One of my first initiatives as the NASA administrator was the CLIPS program. How do we go to the moon commercially? There's going to come a day when um, other nations that might not be friendly to the United States are landing on the moon. We got to take some shots on goal. How do we get there quickly? Well, we need, we need to create the incentive structure for capital markets to fund companies to go to the moon to deliver NASA payloads for scientific purposes. Um, and, and now we're seeing that unfold. And I know 
Redwire and others are benefiting from those, um, those visions that don't just come from me, they come from a great team at NASA that is continuing to move forward with those opportunities. But the future, I think, is very bright. The future is commercial. Um, NASA always needs to be thinking as they go further into the solar system, how do we take what we're doing right now and, and leave behind um, not just a program that ends, but a commercial capability that continues in perpetuity. You know, Jim, one of the things that you really mentioned there that really sticks out is, is that approach with the CLIPS program in particular. It's saying, hey, we are, we're going to take some more risk and we're going to go, we're going to adapt a new way of doing procurement and we're going to get those shots on goal. And I think for us to really move into this second golden age of space, that's what we have to do across the board. Um, and that honestly has enabled some really great technology for, for us here at Redwire, right? We're proud to be supporting the Firefly Blue Ghost uh, mission to, 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 go to, to go land on the moon by developing um, these amazing core avionic systems. And that, without that kind of innovative approach to, to procurement, without taking a little bit more risk, that would have been possible. Also, you know, it would have cost a lot more money for NASA to try to do that. Um, so that's really, really great. And I, I really like what you said about how we need to take what's worked and apply it in other places. Because if we think about low Earth orbit, we think about you know, that transition from ISS to a commercial space station, it's gotta be a capability-based transition, right? We can't have a gap and we need, to, we need to plan for that. We need to put resources into that. But we also need to give room for commercial enterprise, for, pri for private capital to come in and say, hey, we can build that or we can, we can do more. Like just let us get those shots on goal. Let us demonstrate using microgravity as a great resource. Um, and then let's also augment the current infrastructure, right? We also, you know, we at Redwire, you know, a couple of months ago, we put new solar rays, the first two of six total new solar rays on the International Space Station you know, with our great partners at Boeing and Spectralab. And that, that's a commitment, I think, to enabling this platform to, to support that transition, which is really, really great. Um, now, of course, another area that we see coming, uh, you know, in the future is a proliferation of assets in LEO, more assets in GEO, and, and you know, and the, and the threat of things like space debris, and the threat of things like potential, you know, potential adversaries in space. What do you, what do you see there coming, and how might, you know, how might companies like Redwire, you know, help? That's a, a, a great question. So, obviously, proliferated LEO is something that I think pretty much everybody at this conference supports. We have, what we have to do, though, is we have to do it right, and we have to do it intelligently, because too much proliferation too fast without the right you know, tools in place could result in us losing access to LEO altogether because of the derelict satellites or because of debris or collisions and all these other things. So the first thing we have to do is we have to have the right regulatory regime. So, And that doesn't quite frankly exist right now in low Earth orbit. Um, but that's the first part and that will help mitigate some of the challenges. But then we have to do the space situational awareness and the space traffic management. Space situational awareness is, is you know, a, a critical component, but once we have that awareness, um, we have to be able to compel people to maneuver in space, which means we have to have really good data sets on where they are and, um, and you know, their trajectories and all those things. Um, and then we have to be able to do the remediation. How do we get that debris out? So it's really four steps. One is mitigation, space situation awareness, space traffic management, and then remediation. Right now, I think the closest alligator to the canoe is, is mitigation based on how fast a lot of these constellations are, are proliferating. But I also think uh, one of NASA's programs called OSAM is a big part of how do we do the mitigation? Uh, how do we take a satellite that's on orbit right now that might need servicing, maybe it needs fuel, maybe it needs some kind of maintenance, and, and, or, or even um, maneuver it, like attach to it, maneuver it, those kind of things put it in a different position so that it doesn't become a dead satellite, a derelict satellite, an unused satellite. So there's a lot of different ways to, to go after this problem. Um, I really fundamentally believe the biggest challenge right now is getting the mitigation correct, given how fast it's proliferating. But I'll tell you the other thing is, we want to see a future where we've got dozens of human space stations in low Earth orbit from a lot of different companies that are providing services to NASA and other government agencies and commercial companies that are interested in microgravity. Um, that future, if we don't get this right, um, could be at risk. 
it's not going to be a risk because we're going to get it right. Um, but we have to make sure that, that we're doing the right things day in and day out so that that future is very bright. Well, and I'll tell you what I what I see in in that regime in particular in, in 10 or 20 years is that we we have a robust uh we have a robust system of space situational awareness. Like, right, we have assets, optical and otherwise, that are monitoring the entire entire space, you know, all the way out to cislunar, and we know what's going on. We have good rules of the road, so that uh, you know, so that people, you know, so that people are staying well away from from one another. Uh, and that OSAM, you know, and there's that OSAM future that you mentioned that you know mo that every satellite that we're that we start to launch in that time frame is you know is serviceable or is manufactured or is assembled on orbit. So we're stretching that capability that much further. Um, you know, as you know, that's something we're really passionate about here at Redwire. Um, you know, we're building a satellite called OSAM2, which is going to definitively demonstrate the ability to manufacture and assemble on orbit itself. Um, but we also have some really great technologies that will enable a wide variety of assets, right? You know, with camera systems that enable SSA, um, you know, with modeling and simulation tools, so we can say, okay, here's here's a here's a constellation of 5,000 satellites. Here's a constellation of 2,000 satellites. How are those? How might those interact with one another? Where is that risk? Yeah. You know, if it's one in a thousand that satellite's going to run into another. When is that going to happen? How do we maneuver those out of the way? Do we need to deploy a servicing asset to make sure that doesn't happen, or do we need to, you know, re reconfigure our constellation so again we can, you know, so that constellation can stay up and provide, you know, provide the services that it's providing. So that's that's really, you know, those are the pieces that, you know, we're laying the groundwork for, and that's the future that we're going toward. Um, so ultimately, we can enable, you know, a safe and secure, really freedom to operate. Whether, for everybody, yeah. whether it's humans in space, whether it's you know factories in space, you know military assets, NASA assets, doing great science, or telecommunications and other commercial operations, that's really what we're excited about. The, yeah, and I completely the key the key is how do you get infrastructure built in space, and how do you get for every launch how do you get as much infrastructure as possible out of every launch because that's the biggest cost right. of pretty much every mission, and as as you have identified, it's. You know, let's launch the robots that can build the stuff in space. Then we can just launch the materials. Let's launch the robots and materials together, and all of a sudden the volumes go way down, and you can get a lot more mass or a lot, uh, a lot more manufacturing when it's done in space. Right. Um, so look, I know that's a mission that NASA has been committed to for a long time. Obviously, Redwire has a huge interest in that as well as as many other companies that are doing great work in this space. So. Um, I think there's big opportunity there, and it's in the interest of the government to make sure that it's successful. Yeah. What are, what's your perspective on things like space-based solar power? Do you see like large structures in space beaming power back and forth to different assets, or maybe forward deployed military bases? Because I see that in, in the next 20 years. Yeah, so power is everything, right? Um, and when we think about uh, solar power, we need uh, different new materials that, uh, that can ultimately provide uh, more power with less mass, which I know is always the, the greatest challenge. Um, so energy density, of course, is king for for power in space. But yeah, that means we need solar panels that are uh, able to produce a lot more energy with a lot less mass. We need battery systems that can store energy for longer periods of time. In low Earth orbit, you're eclipsed a lot, a bit, ba basically half the time, <laughs> which means your batteries have to be be able to, 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 to be utilized and then recharged and utilized thousands and thousands of times. Um, so, and of course, you know, more power, the more things you can do. Of course, then you've got all the challenges with heat and other things, but right. uh, but certainly um, power is a critical capability for the future. Yeah. You know, when you think about solar power in general, um, I'm, I'm really excited about um, uh, the gateway, uh, which is gonna, of course, have solar electric propulsion. Um, and I know it, in some way, Redwire is supportive of that activity as well, so we're, we're grateful for that. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. Solar electric propulsion, in my view, is the first step towards what will eventually be nuclear electric propulsion, which will cut the time in half to get to Mars. Um, so we need to not just be thinking about the moon, we need to be thinking about how do we take what we're developing right now and and be prepared for that that mission to, to Mars. Well, and I think that's to, that's such a, 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 a an important point, right, is 
we all can envision and, and you know, science fiction has done an amazing job of painting the picture of the future. Even before we could get off the planet at all, we had Jules Verne and all, you know, all of these kind of visions of the future. But it's, you know, but it's important for us to take that vision and break that down into digestible chunks and say, okay, like nuclear electric propulsion, that's how we're gonna get to Mars. But first we have to do, first we have to do solar electric propulsion. And, 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 and now today we need to, you know, we need to build the largest solar arrays we can and put those on PPE and, and, and have this amazing vehicle for Gateway to do that, to do that solar electric propulsion, to do that maneuvering. Um, and that's another area where, you know, we're proud to be building these arrays with Maxar um, to, to do that. Uh, so that we can build that infrastructure to support sustained lunar operations, both robotic and human. Uh, and then, you know, and then we're also really excited about, you know, building infrastructure on the moon surface, right? Using that resource there, like you were talking about before, putting, putting robotics, putting manufacturing on the face, the face of the moon there, building landing pads, building infrastructure, uh, so that we can just sustainably go, you know, and continue to go there. And, you know, maybe in 20 years we won't see tourists on the moon, but I think in our lifetimes, we'll, we, we might even see that. No, that's right. And, and solar electric, I think, solar electric propulsion is hugely important for the moon. You know, we, don't, we don't need nuclear electric propulsion to go to the moon. However, when we go to Mars uh, with humans, that's where that becomes, uh, you know, obviously critically valuable. Um, and, and, you know, um, again, it, it, what it comes down to is energy density. How, how do you get um, as much thrust out of a vehicle for the least amount of mass um, and of course, solar electric is that for the moon, and nuclear electric is that for beyond the moon. So, yeah, yeah, it's uh, the the future is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you want to do some questions, maybe? Or? Yeah, I think so. And and Jim, thanks so much for for sharing this time with us. Do we have any questions from anybody? Maybe not. All right. Well. Jim, again, thanks so much. I, I mean, so much of what we talked about here today, I think, is a is a is a vision that's shared by most of the folks here, most of the folks online. Uh, and but I, I, I but specifically like this vision again, breaking it down into digestible chunks and making it happen. Uh, your work as administrator is it, like demonstrably has moved that forward. So I really just want to just say thank you for yeah. that. Um, and I know we're all members of this small space community and we're going to continue to push forward together. And I'm, I'm really excited to continue pushing that together, forward together with you. Awesome. Well, thank you. And of course, you've been a leader in helping capitalize a lot of the commercial activities that NASA has now leveraged. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been great to work with you when I was the NASA administrator. And of course, wishing you the best of luck as you continue to do these great missions for our country. Thanks, Jim. Thank you.